So how do you preach a sermon on hypocrisy when you are a hypocrite who needs to be forgiven? Watch, I'm about to show you. Jesus is the only person who has the right to preach a sermon against hypocrisy. So I'm going to try to just let Jesus talk from the Sermon on the Mount as much as possible here. This starts Matthew chapter 7, which is the final chapter of the Sermon on the Mount of three chapters. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is sacred and do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. So the first question is, how is this connected to the rest of the Sermon on the Mount? And then how is it eternally, internally connected? How is Jesus staying on the same topic in these paragraphs here? First of all, the commands to be holy from Matthew chapter 5 can lead us to legalism and judging others. But that next section of the Sermon on the Mount on loving from Matthew 6 can lead us to license where we, we just overlook all faults our own or anyone else's and decide that sin isn't really a problem. Instead, we should ask for forgiveness and trust God as the judge of both, both us and others. And that's where Jesus is turning to in Matthew 7. He says, do not judge or you will be judged. This do not judge, as we saw last week, actually means stop judging. Jesus knows we're already judging. That's why he's talking to us about this. And this saying that we should measure and it will be measured to you sounds like it was an existing reciprocity proverb because Jesus used it in several different ways in his teaching at different times. This is like saying another thing he said, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Those who judge will be judged. If we judged, we're in danger of being judged both by people and by God. See, doing to others as you would have them do to you includes how we judge other people. And that's actually where this section of the Sermon on the Mount ends. It begins with, do not judge, and it ends with, do to others. Now, do not judge is the new, most quoted verse in the Bible that has replaced even John 3.16. More non-Christians are likely to know this verse and be able to quote it than any other verse in the Bible. People in previous generations worried about relativism where no one was willing to judge anyone for anything. But today, it seems that everyone wants to judge, or our word for it is cancel, everyone for everything. We've just added hypocritically judging others for judging us to the list of things that we judge everyone for. And even when hypocrisy is real, hypocrites can only see other people's hypocrisy. Pharisees judge themselves by their own motives, and they judge everyone else by their actions. Right? When you're the one acting, you take your own motions, your own motives into account. When someone else is acting, all you see is their actions. We don't know people's motives, so we should try to imagine the best thing possible is going on on the inside of them. Now, this word judging can either mean justice, like a judge would do, condemnation, or discernment, depending on the context. And the verb tense here in Matthew seems to imply a once and for all, 
final judgment or condemnation is what we're talking about. This is judging by pridefully calling someone guilty before God. But the parallel passage in Luke 6 actually says this in two sentences. It says, don't judge and you won't be judged, meaning now judged by people. And then it says, don't condemn and you won't be condemned, which seems to indicate that final judgment at the end by God. We're probably talking about both. And positively, when Luke says this, he goes on to say, give and it will be given to you, forgive and you'll be forgiven, which is included in the Sermon on the Mount here in Matthew, right at the end of the Lord's Prayer. In other words, that's a parallel statement to do not judge is forgive and you'll be forgiven. Instead of saying that blind people can't fix each other's eyes, which is what Matthew says, Luke says that blind people can't lead blind people or they're both fall into a pit. The problem is you can't see clearly enough to judge others. The reason we shouldn't judge others is that it isn't good for us or for others. Now, as with giving, praying, fasting, and using money, which were topics in Matthew 6, Jesus said, don't do this the wrong way. There is also a right way to do judging. You see, the right way to judge is slowly by looking at the end of the path, by the fruit that a tree produces, or by storm resistance, which is what the second half of Matthew 5 is going to talk about, correct ways of judging. First, we're talking about ways you should not judge. The wrong way to judge is quickly by mere appearances instead of making a right judgment, which is what Jesus said in John 7 about judging. In context, don't judge means don't condemn, but do distinguish. You noticed he talked about not throwing your pearls to pigs or your sacred things to dogs. There is a kind of discerning to be able to tell a pig and a dog. The bad judging is hypocrisy. It's not realizing that God is the judge who will judge us too. And this is found all throughout the rest of the New Testament. Romans and James talks about the fact that if you try to be the judge, be careful because God is going to judge us too. And this doing to others as we want them to do to us is the same as showing mercy to be shown mercy, forgiving to be forgiven, and not condemning to not be condemned that's been found through the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. So that's the bad kind of judging. The good kind of judging is testing for fakes. The whole sermon next, next week will be the very end of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus talks about how to test for fakes. Perhaps a way of saying this is that Matthew 7 is teaching, don't overjudge or underjudge. See, don't judge like this. Don't take God's place as the judge. But do judge like this. Call out those who reject the gospel. We, we know a song from this verse. It goes, do not judge or you too will be judged. Do not judge or you too will be judged. That's all of it that I know. You'll have to check out the YouTube video if you want to memorize this verse with a song. Okay, then Matthew 7 continues to this parable about a speck versus a plank in someone's eye. And this parable comes from Jesus, who is the carpenter and the son of a carpenter. He probably knew about getting specks of sawdust in his eyes. And this word for plank that he uses is a board or a beam. This is actually a pretty silly picture when you think about it. There's no way you can actually get a two by four stuck in your eye. This is a funny picture and uh, Jesus, like Old Testament prophets, often used hyperbole to make a point. See, he could have said, don't judge someone if they have a tiny speck in your eye when you have a little bit bigger speck in your eye. But instead he went all the way to a giant plank. Jesus said this another way in in, uh, Matthew 23. He said, um, you guys strain a gnat out of your food, but you swallow a whole camel. There are much more memorable ways of saying this, you know. This judging here is trying to fix someone with a much smaller problem than you have. 
And there's a big difference between judging others in order to make yourself look good, like the Pharisee who prayed in Jesus' parable in Luke 18. He talked about how good he was in order to make the other guy near him look bad. There's a difference between that and judging yourself in other, in, in, uh, let me start that sentence over. There's a big difference between judging others to make yourself look good and judging yourself to help others see better. You're either trying to make yourself look good or helping someone else being able to see. See, do not judge in this parable is a false or hypocritical judgment. Again, there was a hypocritical way of giving, praying, or fasting in Mac in Matthew 6. And this hyper focus on someone else's small sin allows you to ignore your own big sin. In fact, offering to help others can even be a way of covering up your own sin. And yet, forgiven sinners can be of great assistance to those who are still caught in sin. We should care that other people get their eyes fixed. We are encouraged to help others fix their eyes after we've fixed our own eyes. Anger at our brother, which we saw in Matthew 5, can prevent us from helping our brother now. Maybe the giant board we have in our eye is anger at them for having a speck in their eye. The solution is to judge yourself before offering to help others. Now, I found a preacher back from about 500 AD who pointed out that the law cuts both ways. St. John Chrysostom pointed this out way back in his day. You see, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees judged others while the tax collectors, like Matthew who wrote this book, and other notorious sinners, like prostitutes, repented of their sin and entered into God's kingdom. But today, we've got this weird situation where notorious sinners are often just as judgmental and like to judge the Pharisees. You ever notice that? So if you're a Pharisee, don't judge others harshly for their adultery when you are guilty of lust. But if you're a prostitute, don't defend your adultery based on someone else's lust. You can do this in both directions. You can say, I can keep this speck in my eye because you have a log in yours. Right? You ever be tempted to do that? I am. Jesus is the king of God's kingdom who requires all of us to repent in order to enter into God's kingdom. Jesus has just faced temptation on our behalf, and he has the perfect righteousness to offer us in Matthew 4. Jesus willingly took our place in baptism the way that he would at the cross in order to fulfill all righteousness in Matthew 3. And now Jesus offers righteousness as a gift to those who hunger and thirst for it and are willing to admit that they are spiritually poor and don't have a righteousness of their own. That's how Matthew 5 started. Jesus tells us to seek his kingdom and his righteousness and to ask him in faith to take care of our sin in the past, which is forgiveness, in the present, which is temptation, and in the future, which is deliverance from evil and the evil one. He did that in Matthew 6. And now Jesus asks us to trust him as the king and the judge of God's kingdom instead of judging each other. Here in Matthew 7. In Jesus, your sin is forgiven. So forgive others and help them to be forgiven by the king and the judge who is Jesus. Now, eyes here. Have you seen how often eyes have come up in the Sermon on the Mount and the damage that's done every time eyes come up? They're being gouged out or taken in revenge, and now they've got a speck in it. But you know the other thing about eyes in the Sermon on the Mount? They are a synonym for your heart. You see, this plank you have in your eye is actually in your spiritual eye. And God's job as the judge is to correctly be able to see what is hidden. And looking at ourselves in the mirror of God's law is another picture used in James of self-judgment. 
And, and the temptation here is that we are just a hypocrite, which is an actor. We're different on the inside than we are on the outside. Remember that when Jesus revisited the Ten Commandments earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, he said that our obedience needs to come from the inside out. Appearances need to match reality. And Jesus is the only one who can cleanse or baptize our hearts. That's what John the Baptist said about Jesus. He's the one who can actually wash your heart. He can make the inside clean as well as the outside. And consistently, in the measure that we use for judging ourselves and the measure we use for others, is the antidote to hypocrisy. You see, it's wrong to have one measure or weight that you use when you're buying things from others and a different measure or weight that you use when you're selling it to others. You wouldn't want to do business with that, a businessman who measured things a little light when he was buying from you and sold them a little heavy when he was selling to you. You see, there's hope of convincing someone who's not a hypocrite. If we can convince them of what is right for others, then they can apply it to themselves. That was how Nathan convinced David of his sin with Bathsheba. But are we consistent enough in judging others that we are open to have our minds changed at all? If we're not consistent, there's no hope of us changing our minds. And then Jesus says this, do not give dogs what is sacred, and do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet, and then turn and tear you to pieces. How can you correctly identify someone as a pig or a dog if you're not doing some kind of judging? This is the contextual argument that this is not completely against judging. It's about judging the right way. Dogs and hogs are unclean animals in the Old Testament. And this is used as a picture for those who reject the gospel, who have hard hearts and stiff necks and return to their filth. Dogs were not cute, cuddly little things. They were not tame. They would be more like a jackal or a hyena. And this figure of not giving your pearls to pigs has already been used in Proverbs where it says don't put a gold ring in a pig's snout. Jewelry is not fit for pigs. And what is sacred here is what is holy. This could refer to not letting unclean people eat sacrificial meat, which was against the rules in Leviticus. <coughs> This was often interpreted to mean not giving communion to unbelievers in the early church. And I found various commentators who either agreed or disagreed with that interpretation. But a pearl is a treasure. It's the kingdom of heaven. Or it could be a member of the kingdom of heaven. The next time a pearl is going to come up in Matthew, it's the story of this guy who's willing to sell everything to buy a pearl. If we're the guy, the kingdom of heaven is the pearl. But there's another argument about that parable that God is actually the one who sold everything by dying on the cross in order to buy the pearl, in which case we're the pearl. The same thing could be true here. The pearl could either be the message about God's kingdom, or it could be a member of God's kingdom who is the pearl. You see, we should not throw the message of God's kingdom into the mud. We're supposed to share the gospel with everyone, which is actually like scattering seeds into the dirt. In that same passage in Matthew 13, we actually uh, are in a kingdom where the king does a lot of throwing seeds everywhere. And the seeds don't always work. And he's still willing to throw them. And he tells us to throw them. But pushing the gospel on our opponents actually hurts the gospel and just invites persecution. There, there's a wrong way to do this. We should be wise about who we share wisdom with because fools make us look foolish. Do you remember when we're in Proverbs? There's back-to-back -back Proverbs. One says, answer a fool according to his folly or he'll think he's wise. And the other one says, don't answer a fool according to his folly or you'll just look foolish like him. There's no right way of doing this. When you preach the gospel to a pig or a dog and they trample it, you've got to still preach it and they're still going to trample it. In fact, this might just be a warning about what's going to happen whenever you preach. 
See, this isn't designed to hurt pigs or dogs. It's designed to protect pearls. Now, this could also mean, if the pearls are us, it could mean don't throw God's holy people, who are God's treasured possessions, his pearls, under the bus of public condemnation before the world to be trampled by Gentiles. In other words, this not throwing pearls before pigs could be another way of saying, do not judge. Be careful not to kick people out of the church without cause, without due process, and without being willing to forgive. The passage on church discipline in Matthew 18 ends with the parable of the unforgiving servant. Even when someone needs to be punished, we need to be willing to forgive them. Purity is good, but be careful not to judge so harshly like the Puritans in the early United States did. They said they were willing to excommunicate 10 real Christians in order to prevent one fake Christian from getting into the church. It seems like that is going beyond the direction that Jesus is talking about here. So then the question is, we're also invited to think about is, do you react like a dog, a pig, or a fool? When is someone is trying to help you get the speck out of your eye? Do you trample that advice into the mud immediately? It's just as easy to look for planks in other people's eyes in order to deny the specks in our own as the other way around. Then Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others as you would have them do unto you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. We sang one of these verses uh, last week from the song, Seek Ye First. It has a verse that says, Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So, this asking, seeking, and knocking. We're being told to pray for things that Jesus has already told us to pray for in the Lord's Prayer. Or asking for God's kingdom, God's righteousness, and all these things. We can confidently ask God for entrance into his kingdom and the gift of his righteousness when we repent and come to God through Jesus. That's the one thing. When you ask for that in prayer, every single person who asks for it will receive it no matter what. God has promised to give it. No one who repents of their sin and comes to God through Jesus needs to worry that their prayer will be answered. And in the Old Testament, you find that you will find God when you seek him with all your heart, it says in Jeremiah 29. And here in the Sermon on the Mount, this is described as hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And the verb tense here means that we are supposed to keep asking Keep seeking and keep knocking. And asking, seeking, and knocking increase in intensity and duration. You're not just asking for it. You're seeking for it. You're not just seeking for it. You're standing there and knocking on the door. And Luke 11 includes this uh, section right after the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew, it goes to the forgiver, you'll be forgiven. In Luke, it goes to ask and you'll receive. And then he adds a parable about a man who goes over to his neighbor's house in the middle of the night and he knocks on the door and the guy inside is annoyed with him, but because he keeps knocking, he gets up and gives him bread. And the point of that parable is to ask, seek, and knock. That's the conclusion of that parable. It then adds that we can also easily get bread from our evil earthly fathers by asking. And it concludes that we can also be even more sure that we can get the Holy Spirit from God by asking. If you can even get bread out of a 
cranky neighbor in the middle of the night by asking for it, how much more can you get spiritually good things from God by asking him for it? And if you can even get bread from an evil earthly father, how much more can you get what you need from God, both spiritually and physically? See, he moves on to this how much more argument about fathers. Evil earthly fathers are compared to God. All good gifts come from God, which is why we can ask God for all these things. And the most loving of our actions as humans is evil, which is why we should not judge others. We're called to grow up to be like our heavenly father instead. Do you notice that Jesus is assuming that all people are evil, except that Jesus says you, not we. You notice that difference there? Jesus doesn't say we are all evil. He says you are all evil. Jesus is making a claim to be the judge of all of us. So, would an earthly father give you something dangerous that just looks like food? Would he give you a stone instead of bread? A snake instead of a fish? Luke adds a scorpion instead of an egg. Those are all things that look alike. That scorpion egg thing is a little bit harder to see. It's a shell, I suppose, on both of them. The answer to all of these rhetorical questions is, no, of course human fathers aren't going to do that. But God is a good father who often even gives us snakes or scorpions as pets if we want them. Still remember when we were in Ecuador when Timmy came into the classroom of our kindergartner and he was just dejected. I said, what's the matter, Timothy? He said, we learned in devotions this morning that if you ask God for a fish, he won't give you a snake. But I want a snake. I said, Timmy, I, I think God can understand that. You can probably get a pet snake even by asking. Uh, my dad preached on this several times. Uh, as a mini sermon, and uh, every time he preached on this, he found a live scorpion in his backyard, because and he'd put it in a jar and bring it in as his uh, sermon illustration. So my mom forbade him from uh, teaching on this anymore. <laughs> because we have a good father who will even give you a scorpion when you need it as a sermon illustration for the week. But more importantly. More important than physical bread or food, we can get forgiveness and God's word, which are compared to bread in Matthew 4 and 6. We should pray with the correct motives, it says in James. We, we should not be trying to find the right formula for effective prayer, which is a pagan, new age, or magic way of praying. Like we think if we get our prayer right, then we'll get stuff from God. You see, we often don't ask because we ask with the wrong motives, or, or we just don't ask at all. But prayer works not because we have a good technique that can manipulate God. Prayer works because of who God is and what our relationship to him is. God is good, and he is our father. So in everything, do to others as you would have them to do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. So how does the golden rule fit logically in this paragraph and in the Sermon on the Mount? It starts with so, which is also the word therefore. See, this is either the conclusion to this paragraph or it's beginning the conclusion to the whole Sermon on the Mount. If the golden rule is the conclusion to this paragraph, it's this same reciprocal advice of doing to others, being connected to prayer. In other words, give to others if you want to receive from God. If we ask God for good things, we should give good things to others who ask from us, which it says in Matthew 5. Now, I've never noticed that doing to others also connects back to the command not to judge. These are the bookends around this section of the Sermon on the Mount. Do not judge or you will be judged ends with do to others as you want them to do unto you. Not judging others unless you want to be judged is a way of loving others as you want to be loved. This is a theme throughout the whole Sermon on the Mount. Show mercy to others in order to be shown mercy. Matthew 5, 7. Forgive and you will be forgiven. 
Matthew 6, 14. Don't judge and you won't be judged, Matthew 7, 1. And now, do to others as you would have them do unto you, Matthew 7, 12. But the golden rule could also be a conclusion to the whole Sermon on the Mount. See, these bookends, Jesus said that he would fulfill the law in Matthew 7, uh, 5, 17. And now he is summing up the law in Matthew 7, 12. In Matthew, Jesus fulfills Old Testament prophecy, the Old Testament law, and even Old Testament stories we're going to see as we go through Matthew. And the golden rule as love means that the golden rule is the law, not the gospel. They asked Jesus later on, can you sum up the whole law? He said, sure, love God and love people. You know what the problem is? We haven't done either of those things. That's why we need the gospel. In fact, the, the golden rule is found in a negative form in Jewish rabbinic literature. It's even found in Hinduism, Buddhism, and other religions. It's usually stated, don't do to others as you don't want them to do to you. By stating this in the positive form, it actually makes it harder, right? It's easier not to hurt people if you don't want to be hurt. It's harder to actually help people if you want to be helped. You know what? This is actually already found in the Old Testament law as love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's already being stated in a positive form. And God loves his enemies, and that's why we should love our enemies. This doesn't just apply to neighbors, according to Matthew 5. We've broken the golden rule, and thus we have broken the whole law, and that's why we need the gospel. The law is good. The only problem is that we are not, and the law needs to be in our hearts. Only Jesus has obeyed the law, and only Jesus can change our hearts. I want to give you one other note about not judging in the rest of the New, Test New Testament. I think the Sermon on the Mount is found being reflected on in Romans 13 and 14. I, I can't prove this for sure beyond a shadow of a doubt, but as I read Romans 13 and 14, it looks to me like Paul is not only talking about the same topics as the Sermon on the Mount, but he is actually applying the Sermon on the Mount to the church at Rome. You see, when Paul applies Jesus' instructions from the Sermon on the Mount to love each other and to not judge each other, he says that we should be especially careful not to judge each other for disputable matters. See, Romans 13 begins with the instructions about being willing to submit to unjust treatment without retaliation even when it comes from the hand of the government, because God is the true king over all. And I'm glad that God saves tax collectors like Matthew, and that he saved Roman soldiers like the first person Jesus talks to after the Sermon on the Mount is over. But being willing to submit to taxation and being forced to assist the law, even in ca carrying Jesus' own cross, this is a hard thing Jesus has asked us to do. And Romans 13 concludes with a summary of how to fulfill the law, which is the same as loving your neighbor as yourself. And then it's followed by an encouragement to shine in the light as in the dark and for our goodness to come from the inside out. That still sounds like Sermon on the Mount language. And then in Romans 14, it turns to the topic of not judging each other. And the example topic that Paul uses is food, but it's significant that Romans 13 just finished talking about how we relate to the government. You see, differences about how Christians should relate to the government are a hot topic today also. And Paul starts in Romans 14 by telling us not to judge each other. And then he finishes by warning us uh, that we will be condemned for disobeying our own consciences, even if we're wrong. If you believe something is wrong and you do it, you're doing something that you think is wrong. You're still in trouble for, don't do things that you think are wrong, even if you're wrong about being, them being wrong. That was a confusing sentence. Sorry about that. You see, ultimately, we each answer to King Jesus, not to each other. And this is especially true of disputable matters. 
And today is not the first time that Christians have dealt with differences about how they should relate to the government. The church at Rome, like the rest of the early church, included both Jews and Gentiles. And even among the Gentiles, there were differences not only about what to eat, but different ways to relate to the state, depending on whether a person was a citizen or not. This issue has been there since the early church. And in the early 300s AD, there was a severe Roman persecution, and many Christians ended up denying Christ in order to stay alive. And Christians argued about things like if it was okay to lie, if you were asked to turn in other Christians, and how you submit to the government in situations like this. And then after Christianity became legal again in 325 AD, there were fights within the church with a group called the Donatists who did not want to let anyone back into the church who had compromised during this persecution. And St. Augustine argued, and he won the case for allowing repentant sinners back into the church, even if their sin was giving in in the face of persecution. Similarly, C.S. Lewis encouraged both pacifists and soldiers alike in his day at the time of World War II to both follow their consciences before God, but not to judge each other. Do you know how hard that is to do? To say, I am conscientiously objecting, I will not kill, and I don't judge you for joining the army? Or likewise, to say, I am submitting to the government by joining the army, and I'm not going to judge you for not being willing to kill? We're called in the Sermon on the Mount to love even our enemies, to turn the other cheek, to be willing to be persecuted, to be willing to be poor. But let's be especially careful about judging each other for failures in these areas, since these are arguably the hardest things that God has ever asked us to do. Ultimately, the fact that we are citizens of God's kingdom means that we answer to Jesus as master, Lord, King, and God, even for how we relate to human kings. We need to be careful not to just pick sides in culture wars over issues that are disputable matters. You should make informed, loving decisions about what you believe before God. You can even try to convince others about what you believe, but be careful not to judge others for making different decisions on things that aren't clearly taught in the Ten Commandments. It's so hard not to wound each other's consciences when we believe that everyone should do something that we're doing, or that we believe that no one should do something that we're not doing. But different servants of King Jesus will make different choices in obeying him about disputable matters. And that's between each individual servant and their king, Jesus. So how do we not judge practically? See, the worst kind of wrong judging is to judge Jesus as not the true king of God's kingdom. This is what the religious leaders ended up doing literally with Jesus at his trial and at his execution. They executed him with a sign mocking him, saying he was the king when they said he, he wasn't. They objected when Pilate put that sign up. They said, the whole reason we're killing him is that he's not the king. And Pilate said, no, the whole reason you're killing him is that he is the king. Okay? So how, how do we treat Jesus as king and judge? First of all, we should default to not judging others. Second of all, we should check our own eyes and hearts before attempting to perform surgery on others. Then don't throw your wisdom away. And don't throw God's people to the wolves either. Remember, that pearl could be our advice, but that pearl could also be one of God's people. Pray for God's forgiveness, God's kingdom to come, God's righteousness for yourself. That's where the main focus of the Lord's prayer is. And then Jesus talked in this section immediately after judging. He talks about praying. Pray for your own forgiveness and then pray for those you disagree with. 
And trust God to answer your prayers for others by letting God change other Christians' hearts so that their actions will come from the inside out, not from external pressure. In all of this, do to others as you would have them do unto you, even in how you judge others. Judge others as you want them to judge you. Let Jesus be the king, the judge, God. And Jesus mercifully forgives sin far better than we do. In fact, Jesus forgives even our hypocritical judgment. I repent of this sin. I need to be forgiven of this. Let's all repent early and repent often of the sin of judging others.